Morning, everybody. I'm Mark Silverstone, Associate Professor in Presidential Studies and Chair of the Presidential Recordings Program at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. And on behalf of the Miller Center, I'd like to welcome you to a conversation with Frederick Logeval, who is the author of JFK, Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956. It's the first of a two-part biography of John F. Kennedy. Uh, we are now commemorating the 60th anniversary of JFK's inauguration, and it feels like we just commemorated the 50th. Uh, and our fascination with Kennedy and with his presidency and his legacy just does not seem to have faded at all. Uh, he continues to sit at or near the top of polls ranking presidential greatness, and estimates of the number of books and articles on Kennedy runs into the many tens of thousands, uh, exploring any and all dimensions of his life and presidency. But uh, perhaps surprisingly, there have been comparatively few full-length, really in-depth studies of his life, uh, and even fewer of his life and his times. And that's where Fred's book comes in, because he sets out to give us that book, an account of Kennedy and of his era as well. Fred is the Lawrence D. Belfer Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government and Professor of History at Harvard. Uh, he's a specialist in the history of US foreign relations and modern international history with a keen interest in the interplay between domestic politics and international affairs. And he's really one of the world's foremost historians on the Vietnam War. He's the author or editor of 10 books, including Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History, as well as several other distinguished awards in the United States and abroad. Uh, among his many other books, which include narrative texts of American history and studies of the Cold War, I would just mention his 1999 book, Choosing War, which continues to set the standard for all studies of Lyndon Johnson and his decisions for war in Vietnam. Fred earned a PhD in history from Yale. He's had several prior teaching appointments elsewhere, including at Cornell University. And he is a past president of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. I would also note that Fred has been a friend of the Miller Center for over 20 years. Uh, he's an original member of our advisory board for the Presidential Recordings Program, now a member of the advisory board for our, our uh, Barack Obama oral history. Uh, and on a personal note, uh, I'd note that uh, Fred has been a frequent source of insight and inspiration as I myself have tried to come to a better understanding of John F. Kennedy, uh, particularly with respect to his policy toward Vietnam. I'll be co-moderating this session with my colleague, Barbara Perry. Uh, Barbara is the Gerald L. Belisles Professor and Director of Presidential Studies at the Miller Center, where she also co-directs the Center's Presidential Oral History Program. Barbara has authored or edited 14 books on presidents, First Ladies, the Kennedy Family, the Supreme Court, and Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. She's conducted well over 100 interviews as part of the Miller Center's oral histories for the George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama oral history projects. And of particular note for today's conversation, uh, I would just say that she's written superb studies of Rose Kennedy, First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, and Senator Edward M. Kennedy. She writes, uh, speaks, and teaches widely on JFK himself, and most recently has undertaken a new study of the political relationship between JFK and Eleanor Roosevelt and their impact on the direction of liberalism in the Democratic Party. You are welcome to join this conversation as well, and we invite you to submit questions for our panelists throughout the program using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as time allows. So Fred, welcome. It's great to see you. Uh, great to have you here. Um, I'm just pleased. Uh, I, I wanna just say to you, Mark, that it's, first of all, thanks for those kind words, but to be with all of you is wonderful. As you point out, Miller Center is very close to my heart. And uh, when Philip Zelikow invited me, I think originally to be on the, the recording uh, project advisory team. It was a thrill. I have loved all my visits. And I'll also just say that to be with the two of you, you and Barbara for this is a special treat. And I want to tell everybody that Mark 
as he knows, on more than one occasion, when I have been desperate the night before a class <laughs> to have a link to a particular set of audio tapes for the White House tapes, might be LBJ, could be Kennedy, He's right there to send me the link. Uh, it's a marvelous teaching resource, by the way, for any educators who might be on, uh, you know, on the line here. Um, the Miller Center recordings are so good for us. But thank you, Mark. <clears throat> you bet, Fred. And uh, and I hope we'll have some, perhaps even in better opportunities for you in that regard uh, in in the in the near future. Um, I'd like to start today. Uh, I want to give you a chance to, to to flesh out your project, to talk about its scope and and, and your goals. But I thought I'm, I might might get there by by noting that you've been writing about Kennedy in one way or another for for well over twenty years, uh, and I just wonder whether in that time you had felt yourself building toward a, a biography and asking questions along the way that that others hadn't hadn't answered and and maybe that you couldn't answer at the time. Um, and that now is the, the right time for you to do so. And, and, and those questions that you're asking, um, whether they're the same ones now um, that are, are motivating you in this project as, as they were years and years ago. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think without really knowing it, Mark, I probably was building toward this because as you say, I've, I've studied Kennedy for a long time, been fascinated by him. I, I visited the Kennedy library for the first time as a, as a graduate student way back when, uh, and have been fascinated by him, by his era as president, um, certainly. Um, and also have been fascinated by the genre of biography. My wife will tell you that on any given day, the stacks of books next to my bed, next to our bed, uh, is, is, you know, often has at least a few biographies in it. So this is something that ever since I was a kid, I was interested in doing. Um, and I think, uh, again, I don't think it was explicit. I never felt, say, 10 years ago, I want to write a biography of JFK. That came later. But I do think you're right, Mark, that, yeah, I was on some level building toward this, that I thought he's an absolutely extraordinary character, it seems to me, in 20th century history, not just U.S., but international history. A, a story filled with tragedy and triumph. You know, it's almost cinematic when you think about what he experienced. Right. Add to that, and we can talk about this, the era, uh, as I think you suggested, in which, in which he lived, when the United States becomes really a great power and then a superpower. And to be able to tell that story uh, alongside the biography, I thought was great. In, in terms of the questions, I have to think about that a little bit. I'm not sure that the questions per se changed. I think obviously my understanding has changed. Right. I know way more now about, uh, about his life and his career, especially these early years that are the focus of this book, first of two volumes, uh, than I did then. Uh, came to understand, and we can discuss this, things that I didn't before. But I think in terms of the broad scope, it remains this... Um, interest in him, placing him in the in the broader context of American history, understanding, uh, trying to understand both his limitations, uh, because he had them. He's a flawed figure. Also, his uh, his strengths. I think that remains the uh, the ambition. Yeah, it, it's really extraordinary the way that you're able to to twin these together to to tell these stories in parallel. And I would imagine that doing so brings each into relief uh, in a way that, that you couldn't do that um, if you did yeah. it in, in isolation. Yeah, I mean, this is something that, that uh, hit me actually. I was walking here in Harvard Yard. This was probably three or four years ago, three years ago maybe. So I'd, I was well into the project, but I thought, you know, there could be, and I talk a little bit about this in the preface, mm -hmm. there could be a kind of double payoff here not only will I <clears throat> understand Kennedy better by contextualizing his life, and I do think it's incumbent upon all biographers to contextualize. You've got to put your subject into his or her time and place. So that was sort of obvious. But I came to realize, um, kind of an epiphany, I guess, at least for me, that I could understand America better 
in these years, in the middle decades of the 20th century, through the lens of Kennedy. So the debate between so-called isolationists and interventionists prior to World War II. Right. The course of the war itself through which the United States becomes this global colossus. The early Cold War, where Jack and his father Joe are on very different sides about what should be done with respect to the Soviet Union. Okay. McCarthyism. Um, lots of issues like this, Mark, that I thought, yeah, you know what? Maybe we can under look at them in a new way through Kennedy's experiences. So that's the that's the conceit, if you will, yeah. that it has this double payoff. And and uh, just before we we turn this over to Barbara and and she can start to help us walk through Kennedy's life, I would just note that it's we know that you're you're going to write a a second volume. That that's not. Um, a secret, uh, you'll be picking up the story from where you left off here and, and moving through the presidency, but an opportunity to just focus on these years, to, to, to see those years with an integrity all their own and not necessarily to anticipate what's yeah. coming. Although of course we are, is a real treat just to focus on, on, his, on his growth, his evolution, uh, and and the the origins of, of much that we will come to know as as the Kennedy style. Yeah, well, I'm I, I'm grateful for that, Mark. I'm glad you said that, and I, I do think it's true. I mean, one of the things that I try to do as a biographer, um, somebody suggested I do this at the outset, try to imagine that the person you're writing does not become president, does right. not become a world famous figure. Right. Is it still a story worth telling? And I I think that it is, and I think that in this first volume really the coming age, uh, the coming of age of, of, of John F. Kennedy. Um, I think I want to say that it's somebody who is a fascinating figure. One of my themes is that he's a more serious, more substantive thinker from an early age, even in college, than we've uh, thought before. Um, and one reason it became two volumes, Mark, it was originally going to be, as my publisher uh, will tell you, it was originally going to be one fat volume. It became two in part because of what you're saying, yeah. that it's, I thought this is an opportunity to better understand him. And we have marvelous sources, as you and Barbara both know, for this early phase of his life, better opportunity to stand, understand him and his rise, but also understand the course of U.S. and at least international diplomatic history uh, in uh, in these years. Yeah. Thanks Mark. so much. Yes, thanks, Mark. Um, first of all, thank you for your very kind introduction. Uh, people need to know that one of the reasons I wanted to come to the Miller Center, closing in on 11 years ago now, uh, was to work with Mark, uh, knowing of his very profound uh, and impactful scholarship on Kennedy. So to be able to just run down the hall and have a colleague working in the same field. Uh, and then through Mark, got to meet Fred, uh, who was coming to the Miller Center for various events and forums, uh, and now to be uh, closely associated with him on these various programs that we've been doing as he's conducted his national book tour has just been a delight. Uh, so Fred, welcome back to the Miller Center, even if virtually, and we can't wait to have you back in person when we are, we hope, through and on the other side of the crisis we are facing in our life and times now. Uh, oh, thank so you. Thanks, speaking of life and times, can I take you back uh, before mid-century? And so in, in order for John F. Kennedy to come of age, he has to become. Uh, Fred and I had the pleasure about oh, several years ago now of celebrating Kennedy's birthday as they do each year uh, at his Brookline birthplace, which is the, the national historic site uh, for John F. Kennedy, and it is run so superbly by the National Park Service. And so Fred and I were there, along with, I'd say, about 100 third and fourth graders from local schools. It was so hard <laughs> for me to see them out in the audience. They had participated in writing contests um, about President Kennedy. And as I was thinking about this, Fred, today, and Mark, as historians, you'll appreciate this, I was thinking back to when I was at that age in school and how far back I would have had to go equivalently for them to be thinking of this ancient president, oh. John Kennedy. For me, it would have been William Howard Taft. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of to, to Mark's point about 
Yeah. We keep refreshing the public memory and the public image of John F. Kennedy. So yeah. I also have to have, say I have a soft spot in my heart for presidential birthplaces. I think because my parents took me when I was six or seven to Lincoln's birthplace in our home state of Kentucky and the log cabin is long gone, but there's a miniature Lincoln Memorial there and inside it is a facsimile of a log cabin when when you're six or seven years old that makes a big impact. But as a full grown adult I burst into tears at Hyde Park when the ranger went around the corner at the house and said, this is the room that FDR was born in. Mm -hmm. And I just suddenly flooded back to my parents and my aunts and my grandparents saying he saved us in the Great Depression. So Fred. Think, if you will, to that very middle class house in Brookline, Massachusetts, where John F. Kennedy came into the world in 1917. Mm -hmm. And if you will, maybe back up from that uh, to his uh, maternal grandfather, his namesake, John F. Fitzgerald, the fact that politics was genetic for John F. Kennedy. Uh, and then maybe take us up to, I know Mark wants to talk to you about uh, his honors thesis at Harvard, but maybe bridge that gap between pre-John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy coming into the world and then leading up to his collegiate days. Well, thank you, Barbara. Uh, and uh, I do think, as you say, politics is very much part of who John F. Kennedy is from, from birth. Um, and uh, I think uh, we can see the evidence is really strong that he's fascinated by politics, even as a kid. And when his grandfather on the maternal side, John Fitzgerald, known as Honey Fitz, when Honey Fitz would take him to campaign rallies, his own political career was actually fading by this point. Uh, Honey Fitz, his, his glory days were over in Boston politics, but he still tried to run a few times. Um, and little Jack and his older brother, Joe Jr., would tag along with these, um, with, uh, on these rallies. <clears throat> And so I think there is, as I suggest in the book, this early interest. He became a very different kind of politician than his grandfather. JFK was much more reticent. Uh, he was more sort of cerebral. He was um, more urbane, if you will. Uh, those are not words I think that anybody used with the sort of glad handing, um, ebullient Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, but they were very close. There is this interest in politics. I also want to say here a, a bit of a shout out to Rose Kennedy. We talk so much about the influence of JFK's father, Joe, rightly so, very dominant figure, obviously, in the lives of all of his children, including Jack. Rose, because she was more in the background, quite literally, when Joe was home, Rose, I think, is sometimes forgotten. But I think this interest in politics, Barbara, that you're asking about uh, comes much more from her uh, for Jack than it does from, from Joe Sr. Even though Joe Sr. has his own political ambitions, she loved everything about politics. The campaigns, the rallies, the confetti, the, the, the conventions, and she liked the kind of backroom strategizing. All of that stuff she ate up. Uh, and I think JFK got that partly from her and then what happens, of course, a long and I think fascinating story here, but during the course of his studies, his wartime experience in the South Pacific, the death of Joe Jr., 1944, that's important in this trajectory, but he decides he's gonna pursue a political career. I, I don't wanna suggest here that it was inevitable, but suffice it to say, Barbara, that um, it's not enough to say, as many people have done, Many documentaries have suggested, oh, it's only because Joe Jr. was killed that a, a reluctant Jack uh, entered into politics. No, I just don't think I just don't think it's true. Um, this was this was quite natural in terms of his his uh, decision making. I'll turn back to Mark. I know that he's following the stream of questions and has uh, some of his own to follow up on that. Sure, thanks, Barbara. Yeah, I, uh, I would like to ask you about that uh, senior thesis, uh, Piesman at Munich, that, that eventually gets turned into why England slept. Uh, but I, I want to get there perhaps by bringing the audience members in. And we have a, a question from Joseph Oliver, who uh, is interested in, in the impact of, of Winston Churchill on, mm -hmm. on JFK. It's, 
Um, the 1930s, um, Kennedy has gone to Europe uh, 37, uh, an important trip, 39, an important trip. And uh, we know that Kennedy was interested in, in Churchill's speeches. And, and again, I'll hmm. perhaps pose something about uh, his thesis, but, but Churchill hmm. seems to hold a, a pretty important place for, for Kennedy rhetorically, intellectually. Yeah, he really does. Uh, and this is something, Mark, that I don't think I fully understood when I started the research. Uh, lots of examples of this, obviously, as you well know, given your own scholarship, Mark, um, but you, you dive into research and all kinds of things emerge that you didn't expect. And I think a eureka moment for me was precisely this, that I came to see that from his early teenage years, so we're talking uh, 1932, 1933, he's often sick, He's often laid up in the infirmary at school at Choate uh, and then at Harvard. Um, he has nothing to do except really to read, and he's drawn to Churchill's writing, it's clear. Uh, reads the six-volume history uh, that Churchill wrote of, of the First World War. Um, and I think you can see from there, really in some ways to the end of his life, that Churchill is a kind of model figure for him in part because of his skills as a politician, in part because of his skills as an orator. When Kennedy as a house member and then as a Senator wants to become a better public speaker because he's not particularly effective to start with. Uh, he studies the speeches of Churchill. Uh, and then when Ted Sorensen comes into the picture in 1953, he instructs Sorensen, go and listen to and look at um, Churchill's speeches and let's see what we can learn from them. So there is that admiration for Churchill as an orator. Totally interesting to me. Finally, Churchill is a, a writer. Uh, and one of the things that Joe Kennedy has preached to his sons in particular is how much being an author, having a book can help you in your career. Uh, and so, and maybe for his own reasons, Jack is interested in words, interested in writing. I think that's clear. But the fact that Churchill, in addition to all these other things, somehow can manage to produce these books that are often bestsellers, that are highly readable, but also in many cases, serious as histories. Mm -hmm. That's something he just thinks is wonderful. So that, the, the degree to which Churchill is a kind of thread through this story yeah. is interesting. And one other thing I'll just mention here, it speaks to an interesting, I think, aspect of the young JFK. This is a theme in the book, the degree to which he is an Anglophile. Yeah, uh, he just is uh, so. I think it's fair to say in love with, especially the sort of posh, uh, the upper class British uh, ways, um, and the people he encounters in that milieu uh, really resonate with JFK. I think he sees himself as a similar kind of figure. Yeah. That connects to this as well. So JFK seeing himself in. Uh, what he him, what he is studying abroad and the examples that he has uh, abroad in England, and I am thinking about this thesis and uh, and the book that that comes out of it. And I think you 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 nail it on the head that the broader issue at stake here is the role of democratic leadership, uh, democratic leadership at home, uh, in foreign affairs, how one navigates these climates of opinion that Kennedy focuses on uh, in, in both the thesis as, as well as the book, but perhaps more so in the, in the thesis itself. And, you know, it's inevitable that, that we're gonna look back at that time and then think forward a little bit. Uh, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm writing on, on Kennedy uh, in Vietnam right now. In Vietnam, yeah. And uh, as we consider other dimensions of Kennedy in public life, perhaps his reticence to move faster than we would like in civil rights. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's got a lot of forces arrayed against him in the, in the Congress, particularly the Senate, no doubt. But these climates of opinion that yeah. he's confronting and those yeah. in some ways structural constraints, Kennedy's exploring that um, yeah. in uh, 1940, 39, 40, 41. Yeah. And it's something that he seems to continue to wrestle with his whole, how does one, 
um, lead effectively yeah. when you're being pushed around by all these these uh, dynamics. And and I'm wondering if, if you can speak a little bit about yeah. the challenge I, I, that posed to him. Yeah, I mean it's 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 remarkable, and 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 you know, like anybody else, uh, I can't help but read into the read in, read into the present. Uh, in some ways, my historical work. And this was one of those instances, again, where the research, as I got into this, much of it at the Kennedy Library, which I should say here is, obvi- is, a, is a marvelous place, as you both know, uh, really one of the crown jewels in our presidential library system, no question. But Mark, this interest, even as a college student in democracy and democratic leadership and what's required. And of course, the 1930s are a challenge for the democracies, the late 1930s. So it's understandable that a guy who's interested in the world, interested in, in, in political affairs, would, would think about this. But even so, uh, it was striking. You know, I, in one college paper, this is not his senior thesis, but you know, unless democracy can produce able leaders, its chances of survival are slim, or words to that effect. Then, as you say, the thesis itself, which is really about this question, how can leaders respond to a fickle public opinion? How should, they, how should they navigate when they have forces, interest groups arrayed against the policy that they think is correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, how, should they, how should they proceed? Uh, what are the dilemmas of leadership? That's of interest to him and that's a central concern of that thesis. Fast forward to the Profiles in Courage, a book that I recommend to people, especially the introduction and the conclusion, the parts of the book that JFK had the most to do with. In fact, I think he was centrally, he was almost wholly responsible for the arguments of the book and the themes of the book, but in profiles as well, 1956, this is a central concern. Uh, And so you're quite right, Mark, that this is something he grapples with. uh, And I think he will grapple with until he departs for Texas on that fateful trip. Uh, And I think it, uh, it's clearly something that bears on our present situation in lots of ways. Um, really interesting part of the story. Before we turn back to some audience and, and, and Barbara as well, I, you know, I wondered whether the way Kennedy is starting to answer those questions, he's, he's pessimistic ab- about um, what's ahead, about the yeah. capacity of democracies yeah. to mobilize effectively, to, to, to meet the nature of the threat yeah. um, uh, and Again, fast forwarding, I'm yeah. thinking of his speeches in 1961 as he becomes president. Boy, in January, in March, they are full of fire and brimstone, the hour of maximum danger, the, the perils um, around are just extraordinary. We're not sure if we're really gonna be able to make it out. And I was thinking back to, to, to what he was writing here in the 1930s and 1940s. And, and you know maybe there's something of a through line <laughs> To those comments, I I think there probably is. You know, he is a little bit gloomy in thirty nine forty, and he's a little gloomier, I think, in the thesis. The thesis, by the way, is not that different from the book. So, if you compare the thesis submitted for uh, to to Harvard's um, faculty in the spring of nineteen forty, and then the book comes out just a few months later, he only has about a week or two to revise. So, understandably, they're pretty similar. But one of the changes he did make, I think, was to make it slightly less. Uh, ominous or, or, or pessimistic uh, in terms of the chances of democracy prevailing against the authoritarian powers. Um, and Arthur Kroc, who was a close family friend, said to, to Joe Sr., I, this is a great thesis, but I do think Jack is a little too pessimistic with respect to the, the, the chances for democracy. So this remains, as you say, Mark, a concern. Yeah. Um, I think, though, that he's subtly shifting even during the course of the war. He comes out of his own experience in the South Pacific, convinced that the United States must play a leadership position in world affairs. But I think he's now more optimistic that in fact, with American leadership, working in concert with other nations, he's always a believer in collective security, uh, that democracy in fact can not only survive, but can flourish. So I think it's a different tone that we start to get he believes very strongly from his first congressional campaign in 1946 in the importance of compromise in politics, in the importance of reasoning from evidence. These are again themes that I think about in terms of our current uh, politics. That's there, 
But I think myself, and this is something I have to explore in volume two, that there is this fundamental faith in the American experiment. I suggest even in the preface to volume one, that one of the reasons for the strengths of J JFK's legacy is in fact this, that there is, a, there is an idealism, that it's a very inspirational message that he ultimately gives us, including in the inaugural address, um, that you know, carries forward uh, really until today. And then finally, I'll just say those speeches that you refer to in early 61, yes, there's an ominous quality to them, but also another side to them. You know, the inaugural address is often thought of as a Cold War call to arms. I don't think it really is. I'm looking at it right now for volume two. Uh, the second half of that short speech, that brilliant speech, an astonishing speech, 1300 words. Uh, they don't waste a single word, it seems to me, in that inaugural address. But part of it, it seems to me, is much more conciliatory, much more ultimately optimistic. Uh, you know, we should, we should not fear to negotiate, for example. Civility is something to be celebrated and so forth. Um, that's a, a rather meandering uh, response to a great question mark. Fred, can I, I take us uh, to the home front in these climates yeah. and the opinion uh, Mark talked about? Uh, one of them, of course, is anti-Catholicism yeah. and anti-immigration, for that matter. And, and it is a, a, a bit of a, a riddle in the sense that I, I suppose a, a psychologist would say, of course, JFK was embracing Anglophilia uh, and, and circulating with the Protestant or Anglican upper crest of, of Britain while his dad was the ambassador to the court of St. James and of course his beloved sister Kathleen marries into that, yeah. uh, that strata of, of upper class English society, the, the nobility. Um, but something's happened, Fred, since you and I last had a conversation about your book and that is we've elected the second Catholic yeah. Uh, yeah. to the presidency and it took all that time from 1960 till now. Yeah. Uh, what? First of all, feel free to delve into why Kennedy was drawn away from his immigrant roots. But he certainly what he certainly cared about immigrants. He wasn't, and he certainly cared about his Irishness, as you can see when you look yeah. at those wonderful films of him uh, yeah. visiting Ireland in the summer of '63. But I'm also interested in what you've discovered uh, in terms of his own personal religiosity yeah. uh, and his Catholicism. Yeah, there are two very good, in, two very interesting threads there, Barbara. I think that on the on the the Anglophilia, yeah, no doubt, it's partly the fact that his father is the ambassador, um, and he's there at a very critical time, 1938 to 1940. So it stands to reason that Jack and some of the other the older siblings would associate with uh, with that particular strata of British society. But I think it's more than that. I think he. In terms of his reading, he reads, for example, the young Melbourne. Uh, he need he reads Pilgrim's Way in this period, uh, and just comes to really see himself on some level. I think in what they experience. I think also the the qualities that we often associate with 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 posh uh, Englishmen and English women, if you will. Uh, he admired the the sort of the sense of humor, the insouciance, the, the, the supposed grace under fire, um, the kind of flippancy that they, could, that they could exhibit, and this notion of work hard and play hard. That was something that I think he also wanted to do himself. So I think that's there, and many of his close associates, I write, I write about this in, in, in volume one, this will also be a theme in volume two, are in fact English. Uh, and some of his closest connections throughout his life are with, um, with uh, these upper-class uh, Brits. Um, on the Catholicism, it's really important. It's not, I think, Barbara, I'm, not, I'm curious how, to know how you think about this. It's not that he's particularly devout. I don't think he is. In fact, his mother uh, despaired more than once that Jack was not as committed as, say, Eunice, uh, as Robert might be, as several of the kids would be. Um, but he understands that he's Catholic, um, will always be Catholic. Um, there are times, as I suggest in the book, when he questions both his faith and his church. 
But to my knowledge, uh, like these, as far as I could uh, uh, figure out, he never comes close to, to either leaving the church or leaving the faith. Uh, and he knows how much, especially his grandfather and great grandfather and his, his, his ancestors, how much they've suffered in terms of um, um, anti Catholic, uh, anti, anti Catholic uh, sentiments and policies that he's gonna experience some of that too when he does at Harvard, for example. But I think it's there and I think it'll be there in 1960 to just move ahead very quickly. His biggest concern in facing off against Nixon and before that in terms of the democratic uh, primaries is that it's gonna be his Catholicism that's gonna keep him from winning. That's a, that's a constant source of concern. Uh, he prevails uh, narrowly, of course. Uh, and it is fascinating, as you say, that Joe Biden 60 years later, somebody who was inspired to get into politics in part by JFK's example, um, uh, has, now, um, has now ascended to the, to, to the Oval Office. Uh, on, on the religion um, issue, uh, there is another Catholic uh, that, that bears noting uh, in this, and that's Joseph McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have a question from a reader uh, Jeffrey Krasny, uh, who's interested in the relationship between Senator Kennedy um, and as well as Representative Kennedy uh, yeah. and Joseph McCarthy, uh, because the, the ties between uh, the Kennedy family uh, and, uh, and McCarthy are uh, extensive. Uh, yeah. They go in lots of different directions. Uh, and uh, this relationship has a real impact, uh, as Barbara in particular knows going forward, given, given her writing now on JFK and, and Eleanor Roosevelt. So it's a consequential yeah. relationship. Uh, and uh, I wonder how we should be thinking about JFK here. And it, again, it, it, it brings us closer yeah. to today as well. I mean, how do, how do you deal sure. with somebody in political life who yeah. you loathe, but for political reasons, um, there's an upside to to uh, staying close or 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 not um, giving too much of a Heisman, let's say. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's a great question, and I thank the, the um, I, I, I thank you for it. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, just to take one piece of this first, it was striking to me that um, all through, really all through 1954. So this is now by the time McCarthy is on a decline uh, and his, he's clearly in deep trouble. About 35, 36% of the American people were totally loyal to him right through to the end. So that has a certain res resonance. You're talking about a demagogue who has, um, um, has done so much damage to American politics. Uh, and yet there is this... Uh, really sizable minority that is with him. So that has a certain re resonance. But I think, as you say, the Kennedy family is close to McCarthy. Joe Sr. in particular admires so many of the qualities of Joe McCarthy that, that others will find abhorrent. Bobby Kennedy is close to McCarthy. He only works for McCarthy for a short time, but he remains loyal. When McCarthy dies in 57, who flies to the funeral? Uh, rather, you know, quietly, uh, Bobby Kennedy. So he's there for the funeral in 57. So there are these close connections. McCarthy on occasion dates uh, Eunice and Patricia. He comes to Cape Cod, visits the family there. He's uh, in Palm Beach visiting the family. There are these close family connections. So that's one reason for the fact that JFK is always reluctant to publicly condemn McCarthy and his tactics and never really does. Mm -hmm. uh, and Barbara, of course, will deal with this with respect to Mrs. Roosevelt. She, Mrs. Roosevelt, I think, uh, cannot quite understand why, even after McCarthy's fall from grace. Uh, so in 56 at the DNC, which I write about, even now when it would be so easy for any politician, there's no price to be paid for condemning McCarthy in 1956. Even now, JFK is reluctant to do so, which I will say just here in passing, we can pursue this further. I think it speaks in some ways well of him that he's not willing to do that when it's easy to do. Others, others might say you know, that it was foolish, but 
The first issue here then is the family connection. The second issue, which I'll just mention in passing, is that Massachusetts has a huge number of Irish Catholic voters. So you see here the shrewd politician in JFK saying, why would I wanna alienate these people? Um, I will instead quietly distance myself from McCarthy, which he does. I don't think he ever is supportive of McCarthy's antics or policy decisions, but I'm gonna be careful. And by the way, he's really no different from other Massachusetts politicians. Leverett Saltonstall, a very, very um, honorable, um, admirable Republican Senator, very careful with McCarthy. So are the democratic politicians in Massachusetts. Uh, de National Democrats are also for a long time in 52, 53, quite careful about what they're gonna say with respect to McCarthy. So it's a long way of saying Mark, and to the questioner that um, this is not his finest moment. He caused himself a lot of problems with liberals in the party with Mrs. Roosevelt and others. Uh, he would have been, I think, in political terms at least, better served uh, had he not been as reticent as he was. Um, I, I guess we could say he was not a profile in courage on, on McCarthyism. Fred, could we uh, ask you about the fact that in some ways he's used to dealing with the situation of not agreeing with people that he works with or admires because they're in their he, they're in his family um, about his relationship with his dad. And one of the things that among the many that I love about your book is that uh, very gently uh, and and in your deep scholarly way, you counter a number of legends. You've mentioned some already uh, about Kennedy, um, but could you speak more about his relationship with his father? And um, not only that in his thesis he's having to struggle with his dad's isolationism and his dad's fall from grace uh, in American politics and certainly in the diplomatic world, uh, but all the way through uh, yeah. until the end of his life. How, how did he deal with that massively giant personality yeah. uh, who, as you point out, frequently would overcome Rose and push her to the background? Oh, yeah. uh, how did he deal with that both personally, politically, uh, and in terms of his public policies? Well, he was, he, was, he was very devoted to his father. Uh, and that should be said at the outset. There's a, a, a deep mutual, I think, affection between father and son. Um, he admires his father, especially in terms of his business acumen. He has no interest to Jack in going into business himself and following in his father's footsteps. And maybe to Joe Kennedy's credit, he doesn't particularly want his sons, uh, uh, any of them to follow in his footsteps uh, and to go into the same line of work. Uh, uh, we haven't talked about the womanizing issue, but it's certainly also clear that Joe Kennedy, as I show in the book, makes, you know, you know, he indicates to his sons that he expects them to follow in his footsteps in that area. Um, so there's much here that I think Jack admires and uh, he wants to please his father as sons will do. But what's also so fascinating to me, and it's a theme in the book, is that he's his own man from an early age. And you see it here in the relationship with his father more than perhaps in any other area. That from 1939-40, he is willing, as I think you suggested, Barbara, and as Mark said earlier, to distance himself from his father in terms of the assessment about what should US policy be vis-a-vis -vis the, the Nazis and the Japanese. And so his father is an arch appeaser He's an appeaser even after Neville, Neville Chamberlain and his government basically abandoned that policy. Joe Kennedy still wants to make a deal with Hitler, still wants to keep the United States out of the war uh, at whatever cost. Joe Jr. is not willing to distance himself from his father. Totally interesting to me. But Jack is, both here and later. When Jack Kennedy runs for Congress in 1946, when he takes on Henry Cabot Lodge, the mighty lodge uh, for the US Senate in 52, whenever the two of them disagree about strategy or tactics, it's Jack, it's JFK's view that prevails, not his father's. So it's, it's, um, it's ultimately, I think, a much healthier relationship. I've never put it in quite these terms, but a much healthier father-son relationship 
than that which Joe Jr., who was the supposed golden child in the family. He was the one who was destined for greatness. That was, that was not as healthy a relationship because Joe was never willing to, to be separate from his father, um, never willing to stake out his own path. Jack had, I guess, the confidence, the determination to do so. And I think it's ultimately key to his political, uh, to his political success. Fred, if, if uh, we could stay with this relationship um, and expand upon it a little bit, uh, for me, that those were some of the most uh, significant moments of, of the book as I read it and thought more about Kennedy. It, it, it's stuff that occurred to us, but, but you hammered it home so well um, that JFK was not only able to distance himself from his father, which was, was crucial in a couple of times, but he also demonstrated his ability to change, to evolve, and to admit he was wrong. Yeah. And that capacity for learning, for evolution, um, that maturity, um, yeah. if, you, if you will, serves him well. Of course, it gets us to thinking further about his presidency and, and some policy choices he made. Yeah. But uh, but this this dynamic takes us back to a couple places. Just at, I would highlight uh, mm -hmm. his isolationism initially, yep. and he writes this essay for the Harvard Crimson that he yeah. that he has to walk back uh, yep. as he becomes uh, committed. He he's um, Humphrey Bogart. He's he's going to become the the interventionist, the internationalist, yeah. uh, and then again in the. 49, 50, 51 period uh, yeah. when he's a member of the House and he's very critical of the Truman administration. You mentioned that he's a cold warrior, uh, uh, an original cold warrior, and absolutely yeah. he is. And he, uh, so much so that he criticizes his own party yeah. for the way it's handled its affairs in Asia. But then he goes abroad and, and he's an empiricist and he's, he looks around and he asks a lot of good questions. And he says, you know, I was wrong. Um, it's yeah. not just because of the guys in the State Department that, yeah. that things didn't work out well in Asia. Um, we have to, to set our sights much uh, more widely. And yeah. again, I found those to be two highly significant episodes yeah. for helping us understand who yeah. he is and who he becomes. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's right, Mark. I think that uh, he believes that an intelligent person and a mature person uh, who encounters evidence that suggests that you know the previous position was wrong changes his mind. Um, uh, I, I think I think JFK believes that's just a sign of of a thinking person, of a grown up. Uh, when you're confronted with contrary evidence, you weigh that evidence, and if you find it compelling, you change your mind. And I think, as you say, he he does that at, at key points, and you've identified a couple of them. The 1939 is really interesting that he, he pens that um, piece for the Harvard Crimson um, that is really kind of out of character for him in some ways, but he did, but then proceeds carefully on the basis of his interactions with his professors, his own reading of events, his international travels, which I think are critical, especially the trip in 1939, uh, right before the war begins. Um, he changes his position on this. Um, and I think the second episode, the second example that you give, Mark, is so interesting. You and I have talked about this a little bit. That here is a guy in 47, 48, 49, who is very hawkish, to use the later term, with respect to Soviet-American relations. His father, again, is on a different side. His father thinks the Cold War is stupid and is unnecessary. It's actually a reasoned position that Joe Kennedy Sr. has about the necessity of a, of a, a stark um, anti-Soviet position by the U.S. government. Jack totally disagrees with him. And is, as you say, he's even willing to criticize the Truman administration for being, as he sees it, too soft. And yet, in 51, when he travels uh, two big trips abroad in 51, begins to see a more complex picture. As I think I put it, those easy, uh, you know, black and white verities that work so well in po American political discourse don't work so well overseas. Uh, and he says that in fact, we, the United States, we have to be for something. We can't simply be against um, Soviet communism. 
And since we're going to have a lot of new, lib newly liberated nations in the world, we need to figure out how we're going to respond to them, give them something to be for. Uh, it's a really fascinating, it seems to me, much more nuanced position about foreign policy uh, and Cold War politics. And one of the things that I'm going to be tracing in volume two, this will be interesting. I can't wait to get into serious work on this, is how he handles this. Because as you know, Mark, working on Vietnam, uh, this is going to be a challenge for him. Because again, in domestic politics, the smart political strategy is to be to the right of your political opponent, or certainly to be uncompromising with respect to the communist threat. So Kennedy has res to respond to that. Whereas I think intellectually, inside, JFK, who is the JFK who's running for president in 58, 59, 60, and then is in the White House, I think he feels differently. I think there's a disconnect between what he thinks should happen and in fact, what's necessary for, necessary for his political uh, uh, strength, for his political position. And this is a theme that I look forward to exploring. I think it's quite clear, even publicly, that long before the American University speech in, in June of 1963, which is such an epic speech. But if you look at his other speeches, for example, one in Seattle in, in the fall of 61, you already see him trying out this more conciliatory position, uh, suggesting that American power is in fact limited, suggesting that we have to learn to get along with our adversaries, that negotiations are key, et cetera. But it's, um, it's, um, it's an evolution and it's a, it's a struggle for him for domestic political reasons. Uh, I'd like to turn to some more of our audience questions in, in, in the time that we have left Great. and moved uh, more toward the personal uh, dimensions of, of Kennedy. And one from Bob Lorish focuses on JFK's health. We haven't had a yeah. chance to talk about that for a while. Um, Bob notes that he was really struck in, in reading your book by how much time uh, John F. Kennedy spent in the hospital and uh, the challenges that uh, his health presented to him in, in, in his personal life, but also in his, his public life. Uh, I think you, at least my reading of it, um, you underplay that a little bit compared to some other authors who have written maybe a Bob Dalek or a, a Mike O'Brien or a Jim Giglio. And I'm wondering what, what you make of the impact of, of his health challenges on, again, his personal and, and, and public lives. Yeah, I, I thank you, Bob, for that question. Um, yeah, I think, you know, on a personal level, it was hard for him. I mean, you know, uh, ever since he was a small kid, he had these health challenges. Spend a lot of time in bed, as we've said. That can't be easy. You know, friends are out there playing and he can't be with them. Uh, I think, though, in some ways he was quite close to his mother. I do think, as I say in the book, the fact that Rose, maybe because she had nine kids, but this is partly also her personality, um, you know, when he was laid up at Choate, you know, week after week in the infirmary, she did not come to visit him. Um, and she would send somebody else or she would communicate with the Choate um, staff. But that, I imagine, was difficult. It must have been um, for any kid. So there's that. I think you're right, though, that in some ways I push against what other authors have said. And I guess I'll say two things here quickly. One is that I think Kennedy's health problems, lifelong, made him in some ways more empathetic. At least there's a kind of intellectual empathy uh, that he's able, in other words, to put himself into other people's position, partly because of his own suffering and what he had experienced. There's a limit to that. Um, you would certainly say that with respect to Jackie, uh, he did not show a lot of empathy. There isn't that emotional empathy, which is another dimension that one would expect to see. So when he cheats on her, uh, he's obviously not putting himself into her uh, position. But in a different sense, I think his health problems gave him that side. And when we get to the Cuban Missile Crisis, I've been listening to the tapes, thanks to the efforts of you, Mark, and others. 
that empathy, that ability to, to put himself in Khrushchev's position and to instruct the other members of the XCOM, we need to look at this from the Soviet perspective, I think is critical to the resolution of the crisis. The second thing I'll just say here on this question of uh, Bob's question is that we shouldn't exaggerate how debilitating the health problems uh, were in the following sense. I'm just struck, Mark, by his energy on the campaign trail. This guy, day after day in 1946, he's come back from the war. He's not feeling very good. Day after day, after day, after day. He will go from dawn until midnight. His aides will complain of being exhausted. But Jack Kennedy goes up those three deckers here in Boston, you know, uh, time after time after time. He often wears a brace. He's often in pain, but he's going. Uh, and he does that continually. It's almost as though he wants to prove to himself and to others that these health problems are not going to hold him back. Um, so that's, that's another part of this. Great. Uh, that, that leads me, we're coming towards, towards the end here. A couple of things I'm thinking about. Um, Fred, I'm not sure you're able to, to speak about this at this point, but I know that uh, there's the possibility that there could be uh, more media that will come from from your two volumes, um, perhaps in, in the film area. Um, is that something that you can talk about? Is that something that would be in, in a documentary vein or um, a dramatic uh, film that might um, be based on your work? Well, uh, there's nothing to, uh, I certainly have nothing to hide on this particular point. Um, I have uh, an agent uh, focused especially, we're in Los Angeles. Um, and so there's some discussion about that. Um, I think there's a sense perhaps quite understandably that it would be nice to have, if not the second volume out, at least uh, substantially finished. So we'll see. Um, I think there are various other Kennedy projects also that various studios are considering uh, based on other people's work. So we'll see, uh, documentaries are a possibility. Um, and um, I do think, I will just say this, and I think you would agree, Barbara, there is a cinematic quality to this story. Uh, and it lends itself, it seems to me, either to a series, and I, I sometimes think it could be just a series focused on the, uh, the wartime period. Um, and, uh, or it could be the, the whole, uh, life. So it has those qualities, but yeah, uh, that's all I could say at this point. So a host of actors have portrayed JFK from <laughs> series on reels, Greg Kinnear to Rob Lowe, uh, years ago, William Devane. Yeah. Um, I find it very hard to have a, an actor capture the yeah. je ne sais quoi about John F. Kennedy. I think there's just that charismatic quality as yeah. well as cinematic. Um, any thoughts in your mind about an actor you would choose from? from uh, I, I don't think so. I think that Kinnear, what Kinnear captures, which I think is important, is a certain, there's a certain reticence to JFK. There's a, um, a kind of calmness um, a graciousness. He has a certain lightness to his bearing. Maybe that's the wrong way of putting it, but that I think comes through in, in Kinnear's um, um, portrayal. The problem, of course, is like the rest of us, Kinnear, Kinnear is getting older. Uh, and so at this point, you would be casting somebody from a, uh, depending on which phase we're talking about, you might be having to cast a couple of people. Um, but I will just uh, give him uh, a shout out, I guess, in saying that I think it worked pretty well uh, in th in 13 days. Um, I think I, I think he was effective. Actually, that was um, Greenwood. I think. Greenwood, I think yeah. is the, the oh, name. Bruce Greenwood is who I'm thinking about. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. All this time, uh, with all due respect to, to Greg Kinnear, Bruce Greenwood, who, by the way, got married, Greenwood got married in the same place, had his reception in the same place in Vancouver, BC, that I my wife, um, Danielle and I got well, married. So, so I should have known that it was Greenwood. Uh, yeah, so yeah, well, Greenwood. I, sort of. I agree. I thought he did a superb job, but I actually yeah. thought Greg Kinnear, once you got used to to him being JFK yeah. in that yeah. series, yeah. Pretty good as well. Um, no criticism of him. <clears throat> no, not at all. So um, last point before we, we sum up. Um, 
I, I know I know sometimes historians hate the what if questions, but sometimes they like the counterfactuals. If Kennedy had lived uh, beyond 1963, and he didn't think he would live very long because of all of his health issues, particularly his Addison's disease, um, do you think he would have had a development similar to Bobby's, or was he already as as developed as he was going to become? What what would you have said about if he had lived to his 60s or his 70s? Well, I think I think he had, um, and again, this is a warts and all biography. And as you as people who have read Volume One know. And that's those who read volume two, two will know is that he had failings. Uh, he made mistakes. He had shortcomings. But I do think he had greatness within him. So I think, Barbara, that if he had survived, as of course he easily could have done, um, the contingent quality of this, of the, de of the, of elements, uh, the developments in Dallas are just sort of hard to get uh, our heads around. But if he comes back from Dallas alive, I, I think that he was already shifting uh, on civil rights. We haven't talked about that today, but I think it's a genuine shift in 1963 on the Cold War. Um, the, you know, you could make an argument. I don't know how Mark will, de uh, you know, determine this in his own book, but that um, the Cold War is in a sense beginning to end, or at least one can see that prospect. And I think under surviving Kennedy, uh, that could have happened question Mark and I have discussed and that he will deal with that I've written about, of course, is Vietnam. And though we can never know, because it's a counterfactual, I believe the best argument is, though I don't think he had decided on anything before his death, contrary to some authors. Maybe he had decided in his own mind that he was never going to Americanize the war, but I don't think he had formally begun a withdrawal from Vietnam. But I think a surviving Kennedy I believe would have avoided the kind of uh, whole, wholesale, large-scale escalation that Johnson uh, embarked upon. So that what if uh, is, a, is a very important one. I'll say one other thing, Barbara, because I know we're out of time. I think though he believed he wouldn't live long, I think the Addison's treatments were such, because Eunice had it as well. He could have lived if not to a ripe old age. Um, I, I don't think we should assume that he was correct when he told people, oh, I'm not gonna live beyond 45. Um, so I think the possibility was there for John F. Kennedy to serve two terms. I think he would have defeated, I think he would have uh, won re-election in 64, probably would have faced off against Goldwater and he would have beaten him. Served two terms uh, and then would have written memoirs, You know, would have lived into his 70s or 80s. I think that's a, that's a um, not a hard thing to imagine. Well, Fred, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. You and, Mark, you and Mark and I could go on for hours <laughs> talking about our favorite subject. Uh, we just so highly recommend this first volume to uh, all of our viewers and watchers and, and those who will be seeing this uh, on the Miller Center website archives. Uh, we can't wait for volume two. And, and again, we hope that we will have you back in person for that. Uh, so again, thanks to Mark, thanks to our whole Miller Center team that put all of these together and thanks to all of you uh, who tune in. We, we are so grateful for your support. Um, so everyone stay safe and we will see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye-bye.